and which is supported by our global and national platform uh, in the food domain, uh, is uh, intended to bring together uh, cutting edge science, technology, and innovation uh, in that domain of agriculture, food, and health, but also uh, with other science and best, uh, most innovative approach on the sides of management, economics, and social, and so on. And this is within uh, that context that today I'm uh, very pleased to welcome uh, one of my colleagues at the Digital Faculty of Management, Corey Phelps, uh, to uh, talk about an extremely relevant um, topics when we talk about simply addressing the challenge on creating wealth in a sustainable manner in the agriculture and food sector, but more broadly in our whole modern society and economy. Um, and uh, it's work on solving complex organization, organizational problems by bringing the best of what the best consultants in strategy are doing, but not always telling us, combined with also the most cutting edge science in cognitive psychology, behavioral economics, and so on, and weaving all of the above in um, design thinking, kind of a bottom up type of uh, approach to innovation, uh, accommodating or embracing at least the complexity of real world uh, transformation. A brief introduction on Corey, um, uh, with more than 20 years of academic uh, research, his work uh, has been extremely influential in the area of corporate growth and innovation. Um, has published more than 20 articles on this topic in top uh, management journal. Uh, he is the chair of the Technology and Innovation uh, Management Division at the Academy of Management. Uh, uh, and um, uh, the work that he will be uh, presenting uh, is very much uh, the brainchild with two colleagues of his uh, of the uh, work that they do as corporate trainer and uh, keynote speaker and so on. Uh, so, Corey, I think without, uh, well, a bit of further uh, info, just on the logistic, um, the presentation goes for about 45 uh, minutes, um, and then we open the floor for discussion. Uh, I think Sabina, who is our host, is uh, muting all of us as Corey is speaking. Uh, and then you can ask a question uh, either by uh, through the chat box to Sabina, or <clears throat> I will open the floor uh, for direct virtual uh, question as well. Okay. Uh, so, Corey, without further uh, delay, welcome, and I'm shifting to you. Okay, thank you very much, Lorette. So good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome from Montreal here, where it's it's cold, but at least it's not snowing. So what I'd like to do is dive right in and tell you where we're going over the next 45 to 50 minutes in terms of uh, my presentation. The, the plan is basically, as Lorette said, to talk about problem solving from a very practical standpoint. This is based upon a book that I recently published called Cracked It, and it's based upon research across the social sciences, but we try to distill that research and talk about and provide advice to, to managers or really anybody working in an organization on how to solve difficult or complex organizational problems. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges of problem solving, uh, and that's going to lead me to talk about why we need a discipline method, and then I'm going to present to you the method that we've developed, which we call the 4S method. So I'm going to walk you through each component of that, stating the problem, which is very much about defining the problem up front, structuring the problem, which is very much about how you search for potential solutions, solving the problem, which is very much about performing the analysis on these potential solutions, and then, of course, selling the problem. In other words, convincing others that you have the, the right solution. And as Lorette mentioned, we'll spend some time at the end with uh, question and answers. So that's where we're gonna go. And what I'd like to do is, is really start off with a story. Um, and this is a story that comes from, from the corporate world. And it's a story about Dell. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Dell. 
It used to be Dell computer, now they're just Dell. And uh, on your screen there on the left-hand side, you see someone that you, you may be familiar with, that's Michael Dell. That's the founder of Dell Computer. The gentleman on the right-hand side you may be less familiar with, this gentleman's name is Kevin Rollins. Kevin Rollins was a strategy consultant for Bain, and he advised Dell on its famous direct business model. Some of you may be familiar with Dell. They avoided using retailers. They sold directly to, to organizations, enterprise customers, and then consumers, and Kevin Rollins was one of the lead strategy consultants on that. He was then hired by Michael Dell, and eventually he rose to the chief operating officer of Dell, and he was the hand-picked successor by Michael Dell to step into the shoes of being the CEO of the company. And Michael Dell would leave day-to-day -day operations and become the chairman of the organization. So what I wanna do is I wanna tell you what happened after Kevin Rollins stepped into the role of CEO as Michael Dell exited. So if this is uh, what you see here on the screen is Dell's stock price. Um, and the stock price is just around the time that Kevin Rollins became CEO, which happened on July 16th of 2004. The stock price peaked a few months later at $42 of share, and then things started to go awry. So one thing that happened was Dell's revenue started to slow in terms of its growth, and as a result of that, its market share in the personal computer industry started to decline. So much so that HP became the world's largest manufacturer of personal computers, overtaking Dell. And that was partly a result of HP acquiring Compaq. The next thing that happened is over the course of about two years, Dell missed multiple analysts estimates of what their earnings, their profits would be. So Dell's performance actually came under the uh, or below that of the analysts. Then some of you who maybe had the misfortune of owning Dell computers, especially laptops, may remember that some of these computers started to catch on fire to explode. And this had to do with battery problems that, that Dell had. So just to take stock, Dell's revenue is declining. Its profitability is declining. Batteries are catching on fire and exploding. And then in the United States, where Dell is based, the Securities and Exchange Commission launched an investigation into Dell's reporting of their financial results, and they forced Dell to restate their profits for four previous years. The final thing that happened towards the end of this time period is every year Dell does a survey of its entire employee base. And one of the focus or foci of the survey is that uh, they ask employees how well senior leadership is performing. And in this particular year, which is about 2009, uh, the employee survey came back and showed that there was widespread dissatisfaction with senior leadership. So while these things were going on, Dell's stock price was declining dramatically from its peak in uh, 2004 of $42 a share to 2009, it declined to $8 a share. Now, from my perspective, this is a classic problem. Something has clearly gone wrong. In other words, the hand-picked successor for Michael Dell, Kevin Rollins, under his leadership of the company, has experienced a tremendous performance problem. And the question that I'll pose to you, very much as a thought experiment for yourself, is if you were in the shoes of Michael Dell, you were the chairman of the company, your hand-picked successor has come in, and during his watch, the company's performance has declined dramatically, Shareholders are screaming for a change. Employees are screaming for a change. Other stakeholders want a change. What would you do? Now, I know you can't answer me because your microphones are muted, but what many people respond when I ask this question is they respond very simply, very quickly, and say, Kevin Rollins should be fired and Michael Dell should step back in as the CEO of the company. What's great about that is that's a very simple solution. You arrived at that quickly. But again, I think what we need to learn here is that there's probably a lot more going on with the Dell story than what we see on the surface. So what I would like to tell you is just a little, th a few things behind the scenes is that revenue growth had slowed because the nature of competition, the personal computer industry had changed. Kevin Rollins had very much wanted to change the strategy of Dell, but Michael Dell pushed back greatly against that. 
The other thing that happened is, as I mentioned, HP acquired Compaq, which again put pressure on Dell. This was something that was outside their control. And the declining profitability very much had to do with the changing nature of competition, which Kevin Rollins wanted to adapt to, but was largely prevented from doing so from Michael Dell. The batteries exploding were largely attributed to Sony, the supplier of the batteries. The SEC investigation was launched because of uh, financial filing problems that existed during the era of Michael Dell, not during the era of Kevin Rollins as CEO. So again, my point is there's a lot more going on under the surface here, but what is very common for people to do, especially managers to do, is to come to a very quick solution. In other words, we see a few pieces of information. We are able to construct a very simple story, a narrative or a theory in our mind that says we understand what the cause of this is. The cause is poor CEO, poor performance of a CEO, and we come to the conclusion very quickly that the CEO should be replaced. Now, this is one way that, that many managers and many human beings, for that matter, solve problems. And I think this is the way that, that uh, Othello, if you're a Shakespeare fan, solve problems. So if you know anything about the story of Othello, it's Shakespeare, so it's a tragic story. But Othello is married to the love of his life, Desdemona, and happens upon to see another woman that has a handkerchief in her possession that he had, that Othello had given to his wife, Desdemona. So what he does is he takes that piece of evidence, the fact that another woman has the handkerchief, and then he adds that piece of evidence to another part of the story, which is he knows that Cassio is dating this young lady that he sees with this handkerchief. And he immediately jumps to the conclusion that Cassio had gotten this handkerchief from his wife, Desdemona, because Cassio was having an affair with Desdemona, gave the handkerchief to this young lady. Othello then jumps to the conclusion that his wife is having an affair and in Shakespearean fashion, tragically kills the love of his life. And he's wrong about this. So he sees two pieces of information and he quickly jumps to a solution that leads to a disastrous outcome for both him and his wife. In a separate Shakespeare story, the story of Hamlet, there's a very different approach that many people take to solving complex problems. And this is the approach characterized by Hamlet. You're familiar with the Hamlet story. Hamlet's father has been killed. He's been killed by Hamlet's uncle, the king's brother, Claudius. As a result of killing off Hamlet's father, Claudius marries Hamlet's mother. Now, throughout the entire play, Hamlet knows with great certainty what has happened. Claudius has killed his father, but he is paralyzed by the analysis that he is performing because what he wants to do is he wants to make sure that he has 100% credible evidence that he can present to the royal court to demonstrate beyond a shadow of a doubt that Claudius has killed his father. So in the end, Hamlet does nothing. He takes no action because he's paralyzed by this analysis. And in the end, the, uh, the Danes' great enemy, the Norwegians, basically take over the Danish kingdom because the, there's insurrection and essentially the royal court has set upon itself to kill each other. So again, this story ends tragically, not because Hamlet jumps to a conclusion, but largely because Hamlet is paralyzed by analysis. So again, my point is that there tend to be two extremes approaches that we take to solving problems in organizations. We're either like Othello, where we quickly jump to an unfounded solution, or we're like Hamlet, and we're paralyzed by analysis and don't come to any solution. And what this means is that human beings either A, tend to jump to solutions, or B, are paralyzed by analysis. Now, that's all fine and good, but does it really address the point why we should care about complex problem solving inside organizations? I want to speak to that question. And to do so, I want to give you some pieces of evidence. So one piece of evidence comes from a recent survey that was published by a leadership consultancy in the United States, Zenger Folkman. And what they did was they surveyed over 300,000 managers worldwide at different levels of the organization, from frontline supervisors all the way up to senior leaders inside these organizations, across different companies, across different industries. And what they were looking for is they were looking for answer to the question, what are the skills that managers need most to be effective? 
Now, number two on this list in terms of their rank ordering was solving problems and analyzing solutions. This comes in second just behind inspiring and motivating others, which for me is very much the definition of being a good leader. So clearly what this survey is telling us is that managers inside organizations definitely need this skill set. Another piece of evidence comes from the Economist Intelligence Unit. They were looking at essentially how should organizations, excuse me, how should societies and their educational institutions best prepare students for the future? And one of the things that they looked at in the study are what are the critical skills that students, upon entering the workforce when they're adults, what are the critical skills that they will need to be successful, regardless of whether they're a manager or working uh, as a solo professional inside the organization? And again, the question they asked is, of the following, which are the most critical skills for employees in your organizations to possess today? And first on the list was problem solving. They also asked survey respondents, which consisted of not just educators, but also managers inside organizations, where do you see the future going? In other words, what are the skills that people are going to need going forward? And in responding to that question, 70% of the respondents expect problem solving to become even more important going forward in the future. So again, Another piece of evidence that problem solving is a critical skill that people need working inside organizations. A third data point comes to us from the World Economic Forum. So for the last few years, uh, they've been publishing what they call the Future of Jobs Report, which is where they're looking at what are the skills that people inside organizations need to be successful in contributing to their organization success. Uh, previous study done back in 2015 looking both in the present at 2015 and thinking five years out, again, number one on the list was the ability to solve complex problems. The fourth and final point that I wanna drive home because it's, it's close to my heart is, uh, as a management professor is our MBA students. So the Financial Times uh, in the UK for the last few years has been surveying recruiters, people that actually hire MBA students. And in this survey, they asked two very important questions. Question number one, what are the skills that you're looking for uh, when you hire MBA students? And in the top five skills that they're looking for is the ability to solve complex problems. The second question that they asked the recruiters is, what are the skills that you find the most difficult to recruit for? In other words, what are the skills that are the most difficult to find? And again, what we see is problem solving is in the top five. So what this tells us is that on the one hand, we as human beings tend to either jump to solutions or we're paralyzed by analysis. Either way, we're not particularly good at problem solving. Number two, problem solving is a critical skill that we need inside our organizations. And now the final point for me that motivates this focus on problem solving is unlike learning how to walk when we're little, problem solving doesn't come naturally. In other words, we think that the more we do it, the more experience we have with solving problems, the better we get at it. And again, that's not necessarily the case as I'm going to demonstrate to you by a couple of additional stories. Now, the reason that we, we don't necessarily learn how to solve problems better as we do it more frequently is because, again, human problem solving is characterized by a few pitfalls. Pitfall number one that I'll talk about in a minute is we often don't bother to find the problem and as a result, we don't really understand the problem. In other words, we have a poor problem definition. Sometimes we lock in very quickly on a solution, and that solution blinds us to considering alternative solutions that might be better, so we suffer from the confirmation bias. A third problem is the frameworks, literally the theories that we use to solve problems, trap and constrain our thinking. This is often referred to as Maslow's hammer after the famous psychologist who's famous for the hierarchy of needs, uh, Maslow is alleged to have said, I imagine that if you only have a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. So if you have a, a framework, a few frameworks that you are, that you frequently use to try to understand problems, and you, those are your go-to frameworks, then oftentimes those will constrain your ability to search for, for good solutions to a problem that you're working on. Uh, another challenge that we have as human beings is that we reason by analogy. Now, Reasoning by analogy can definitely be beneficial for us, but as you're going to see here in a minute, it can have its downsides. And then finally, oftentimes when we try to convince others 
of why they should follow our solution, we, we tell them the story about how we arrived at the solution rather than telling them the story about why they should adopt the solution. So again, we don't often develop compelling persuasive stories for our solutions. So I want to t tell you a couple stories to drive these points home. One is a story about the music industry when the music industry went digital. So back in 1981 is when the CD was invented, which is when music went from essentially analog on vinyl records to digital. And then along came the internet and digital music that was once stored on CDs now could be distributed uh, through the network. And that's when we saw back in the mid 1990s, the rise of peer to peer networking, for example, organizations like Napster. And what this led to was individuals literally ripping music off their CDs, saving it as files on their hard drives, and then sharing it with other individuals. The music industry and their trade association, the RIAA in the United States, viewed this problem in the following way. They viewed the problem as a problem of piracy. And as a result, they asked the question, how do we reduce piracy? In, or how do we better yet eliminate piracy? Now, that's one way to frame the problem, but if the real problem is, or, or what you see as an indicator that you have a problem is that your sales are declining and your profits are declining, you could frame the problem as, how do we improve sales and profits of recorded music? Instead, the recorded music industry defined this as, how do we eliminate piracy? And once we frame the problem that way, that leads us to think about, if we're gonna stop piracy, we need to sue, and if we're going to sue people to stop piracy, we need attorneys. And this is precisely what the recording industry did, is they hired attorneys and they aggressively sued the peer-to-peer -peer platforms like Napster, and they even sued individuals. In the end, they were very successful in shutting down these peer-to-peer -peer web uh, sharing, excuse me, music sharing sites, and they greatly reduced piracy. But in the end, it had very little effect there was an alternative way to frame the problem. The alternative way to frame the problem is to view this as an opportunity and to ask the question, how might we be able to make money on digital music? This was the way that Steve Jobs and Apple framed the problem, which led them to the development of iTunes and to become a very early mover into using a digital platform and being able to figure out how to monetize digital music. So one of the pitfalls that we have when it comes to problem solving is that we don't define the problem particularly well. The second uh, pitfall that I want to talk about relates to this gentleman. This gentleman's name is Ron Johnson. Ron Johnson also relates to the Apple story because Steve Jobs hired Ron Johnson to create Apple stores. Before Ron Johnson worked at Apple, he worked in the United States at a mass merchandiser called Target. And he's literally the one accredited uh, to creating what Target is today, which is selling essentially upscale branded merchandise for everyday low prices. So when Apple wanted to enter to, into the retail industry, they hired Ron Johnson away from Target. Then a few years later, uh, a very old department store chain in the United States, JCPenney, came along and recruited Ron Johnson away to try to save JCPenney. J.C. Penney, some of you know, is a very old traditional department store retailer that had, in the last decade, fallen on hard times. Its revenues were largely flat. Its profits had declined. It was, its merchandise was viewed as old and outdated. So Ron Johnson was hired to essentially save J.C. Penney from the scrap heap of history. So what I'll do is quickly tell you the story of Ron Johnson. The day that his hiring was announced on June 14, 2011, J.C. Penny stock price increased by almost 18 percentage points. In other words, equity investors viewed Ron Johnson as being a potential savior for the company. So they welcomed him because they thought he would save the company. He actually started work on November 1, 2011. And within a few months, he announced that he had the answer to J.C. Penney's problem. On January 25th, 2012, in New York City, he held a launch event where he basically described his solution to J.C. Penney's problem. 
And the solution consisted of a few basic items. Number one, Johnson declared that he was going to introduce everyday low pricing, much like he did at Target a decade before. JCPenney was a notorious discounter. They aggressively used coupons in the Sunday papers in the United States that offered discounts on merchandise. Johnson said, we need to eliminate that. So he pursued a policy of everyday low pricing. The second thing he did was he fundamentally reorganized how JCPenney sold merchandise. Traditionally, if you walked into a JCPenney store, you would see a very traditional merchandise layout organized by function. So for example, you would see men's suits, you would see children's wear, you would see home furnishings. Johnson's idea is that we're going to actually organize our merchandise by brands. So he came up with the idea of 100 boutiques inside the store. In other words, you would walk into a JCPenney and you would see the Levi's boutique. And all Levi's merchandise would be housed in the Levi's boutique. You would see the Martha Stewart boutique. You would see the Joe Fresh boutique. So if you're Canadian, you might be familiar with Joe Fresh as a Canadian brand. So he fundamentally wanted to reorganize the merchandise, uh, merchandising approach inside JCPenney. Another thing he did was he launched an intense advertising campaign where he changed the name of JCPenney. He thought JCPenney was old and stodgy, so he dropped the name and started to referring to the company as JCP. And as a result of that, came up with a new brand and rolled this out uh, across the country. The final thing he did was he greatly reduced the number of cash registers inside JCPenney stores. He gave frontline employees, sales clerks, tablet computers so they could check out customers on the sales floor. He was so confident that this strategy was the right strategy that he rolled this strategy out across the 1,100 stores that JCPenney had in the United States back in 2012. Rather than saying, I'm uncertain that this is the right strategy and as a result, I want to test this in maybe one or two pilot stores before deciding whether or not this strategy would work across the entire chain. When he was asked by a board member, why shouldn't he or why didn't he think about testing, his response, according to many uh, reports that we read in the press, was we didn't test at Apple. What this tells us is that Johnson was extremely confident that he had the right solution. What happened was he was proven wrong otherwise. In May 15, 2012, just a few months after the launch, JCPenney reported a $55 million loss. They then announced that they were selling a large stake in a mall owner that they had in the United States to raise cash to roll out these changes across the company. It cost JCPenney almost $1 billion to make the changes that Johnson announced on January 25th. Some of this money they had to raise from external sources by selling their stake in Simon Property. They then rolled this out and things started to go from bad to worse. Uh, next quarterly report in November 9th, 2012, they reported $123 million loss. A few months later in February of 2013, they reported a $552 million loss. By April 19th, Johnson was out as CEO and he was replaced by the gentleman that he replaced. During the Johnson era, the stock price at JCPenney fell from $43 a share to $14 a share. This was a disaster on many dimensions. And this was largely the result of two pitfalls that we face as human beings when we solve problems. We often solve problems by reasoning through analogy. In other words, we look at a problem that we're facing today and we ask ourselves a very basic question. Have I seen a problem like this before? If I have, I ask myself, what worked in that situation? Because if it worked in that situation, it will surely work here. What Johnson did was he used elements of what worked for him at Target, what worked for him at Apple stores, and simply assumed that they would work at JCPenney. The core assumption being that JCPenney customers are very much like Apple and Target customers. And what he realized after the fact was that JCPenney customers loved the thrill of the discount. They loved the thrill of the hunt. So his every Everyday low pricing strategy 
was largely rejected by these customers. His approach to merchandising was largely rejected by these customers, largely because they had spent a hundred years organizing merchandise by function. So customers had come to expect that by implementing his hundred brand approach, he largely created confusion in the minds of his customers. The other pitfall that he fell prey to was the confirmation bias. He was so confident that he had the right solution that he said to others inside the organization and outside, we don't need to test this. This will work. Trust me. And what we see is this had disastrous consequences. So again, let's take stock of where we are in the conversation. Number one, problem solving and the ability to sell our solutions is a critical skill set that we need inside organizations. Number two, we know that this doesn't come naturally. There are numerous pitfalls that trip us up. What this means to me is that we need a disciplined approach to solving problems. We need a disciplined method to solving problems. So what I would like to do is spend the rest of the time that I have with you today and walking you through rather quickly our structured disciplined approach to solving problems, which we refer to as the 4S method. From stating the problem to structuring it to then solving it and then to selling the solution. What I'd like to start with is stating the problem. And I'd like to echo Albert Einstein's argument about problem solving where he said, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend the vast majority of my time, 55 minutes, in thinking about the problem. In other words, understanding and defining it and then using that foundation to then solve the problem. To the pitfall that we saw in the music industry, oftentimes we don't quite understand the problem, which leads us to frame it in a very narrow way and come up with poor solutions. So what we talk about in the book is we introduce what we call the Tosca framework. So if you're hearing music play, it's not your computer that's on the fritz. This is a song called Disi Darte, and it's a song from the Giacomo Puccini opera called Tosca. And we use Tosca as an acronym for how to define a problem. So in order to help you understand this, I want to walk you through the synopsis of the opera Tosca. So in the opera Tosca, Tosca, you see there the woman at the top of your screen. Tosca is in love with the character Mario and Mario is in jail and Mario is set to be executed in the morning. Tosca is understandably very worried about this, and she wants to make sure that she can get Mario out of jail alive and then run off with him. The challenge for Tosca is that she is a virtuous woman, and there are things that she absolutely will not do, constraints that she imposes on herself, even to save Mario. And it's these things that Scarpia, who is the chief of police, who has imprisoned Mario, wants from Tosca. So the problem statement for Tosca is, how do I get Mario out of jail alive without yielding to Scarpia? So this is the synopsis of the opera, but each of those elements maps to our framework for how to define a problem. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you see the elements of the synopsis of the opera that I just walked you through. And on the right-hand side, you see a framework to use to define any problem. For example, we tend to think about problems in terms of trouble. In other words, there are signs, there are indicators that we have a problem. So in the JCPenney case, it was declining revenue, for example. It was customers abandoning JCPenney and shopping at other stores. In the context of the movie industry, it was people using peer-to-peer -peer sharing to get music for free rather than paying for music. So those are all indicators of trouble. So typically when we define a problem, we think that there's trouble. In other words, the current state is not what we want the future state to be. The second element of any problem definition is asking yourself the question, who owns the problem? In other words, whose problem is this? In the example of Tosca, Mario is Tosca's problem. She owns the problem and it's her responsibility to come up with a solution. The third element of any good problem statement is what is going to define success? In other words, 
how will you know when the problem has been effectively solved? In the context of the Tosca example, it's Mario getting out of jail alive. All problem solving efforts have constraints. In other words, what we must abide by in solving the problem. And then finally, all problems have stakeholders. In other words, there are individuals and groups who are fundamentally interested in the problem and therefore the solution and can influence what happens in the problem solving process. So these elements, talk, trouble, owner, success, constraints, and actors are elements of a good problem statement, which then leads you to coming up with the core question, as we call it, that will then guide the search for solutions. So in the book, we provide a Tosca worksheet, and this worksheet can be used to help define and state any problem that an organization faces. I won't walk you through all of the elements of this. What I would like to do is emphasize the core question to be answered. What we try to do with the core question is we try to reflect the elements of the Tosca statement. In particular, what is gonna define success? And then what are the constraints that we're facing? And what we like to do is we like to frame these questions as how might we solve this problem? In other words, how might Tosca get Mario out alive without yielding to Scarpia, rather than framing the question as how should we? How might we gives us much more degrees of freedom, much more motivation to explore the potential solution space. How should we solve a problem often implies that we have very strict criteria in mind that often narrows our search for a solution. So this is a tool that we can use to define problems, in other words, to state the problem. And an example of a bad core question statement is again going back to the music industry where they define the problem. The core question is how do we stop or dr drastically reduce the illegal sharing of music files to protect the business of selling CDs? In the minds of uh, industry executives in the recorded music industry, trouble for them was declining sales not piracy. But what they did is they ignored how they defined trouble in terms of declining sales and very quickly zeroed in on piracy, which led them to a very narrow search for solutions. In other words, once I define the problem as piracy, I then jump to the solution that we're going to have to reduce this by suing companies and suing individuals. So a classic example of a poor problem definition. Once we have a well structured problem. In other words, we have a core question that reflects the trouble, that reflects the owner, that reflects what defines success, what the constraints are, and who are the stakeholders. We can then go into searching for solutions. We refer to this as structuring a problem. And one of the things, the tools that we talk about in the book to structure a problem are to decompose that problem into smaller issues. Now you see a cartoon here, which is about structuring a problem by decomposing it. The purpose of what I'm going to talk about issue trees isn't to blame other people. It's actually to identify a, a much greater possible number of solutions to the problem. And the way we're going to do that, or the way we talk about doing that is through what we call issue trees, which is a core tool in the world of strategy consulting. So an issue tree starts with the core question. And then what we do is we try to decompose potential solutions into questions. So what an issue tree does is it forces us to provide a comprehensive overview of all of the possible factors that could be impacting the problem. In other words, all the possible solutions. It's requiring us to decompose or break down the problem into finer or more specific questions. In order to do this, it encourages us to use theory or frameworks. In other words, we need things to structure our thinking about potential solutions. And this is where theory and frameworks can be quite useful. Coming up with issue trees or using issue trees are critically important at the very beginning of a problem solving process. It creates and sparks a conversation that we can have with different stakeholders about how we might go about coming up with potential solutions to the problem. And again, it, we want to pose these potential solutions as questions, because again, once we ask the question, we have to answer the question, 
And that comes with by doing analysis and then using that analysis to identify what are the answers to the question. In other words, to zero in on what the solution is. In other words, we use issue trees to identify all possible paths to solving a problem. Now, issue trees, there are some elements or principles of what a good issue tree is. So number one, we frame an issue tree as questions rather than as answers to the core question from Tosca. What we wanna make sure of is that the, the uh, composition, or I should say the decomposition of the issue tree is what is known as MISI. So I'll talk about MISI here in the next slide, but MISI means to be mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. If we are forced to be mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive in our issue trees, what we are asking ourselves to do is be exhaustive in our, in our search for potential solutions. The reason that MISI is a principle of good problem solving is because it tries to overcome the pitfall that human beings face of quickly jumping to a solution and therefore not considering a large number of alternative solutions. If our issue trees are MISI, then we have exhausted the potential solution space. Sub-issues in a issue tree need to be consistent. In, in other words, they can't be contradictory to one another, and they also must be relevant. In other words, those issues and sub-issues must address the core question. So I'll talk about MISI, and then I'll give you an example of what structuring can look like, a very simple example. So mutually exclusive means that there's no overlap with our potential solutions. In other words, it forces us to think about solutions that are independent of one another. Again, creating a motivation to search broadly for solutions rather than narrowly. Collectively exhaustive forces us to consider the entire solution space, to leave essentially no stone unturned, to leave no gaps in potential solutions. In other words, if we abide by the Misi principle, we can think about the metaphor of a jigsaw puzzle where we've identified all possible pieces in the puzzle, and we've identified how all of these pieces fit together. A very simple example of this is one that I often use with my MBA students. And there the, the core question from the problem statement could be posed as, how can I reduce my grocery bill each month by 20%? So if I have a budget constraint that I'm operating under, I have a very specific target, 20%, and I want to do this on a monthly basis. If that's the problem that I'm facing, then I can think about decomposing this problem into one of two alternative primary issues. Should I reduce my costs directly? In other words, should I do, reduce my unit costs? So unit costs meaning each item that I buy at the grocery store. Alternatively, Rather than focusing on cost, should I reduce the volume of the units that I purchase? These are two mutually exclusive alternative approaches to solving the problem. I can then decompose reducing cost into a couple of different alternatives. I might reduce my unit cost by buying lower quality goods. Alternatively, I might reduce my unit cost by buying in bulk and therefore getting a discount on this. So again, there are various ways that I can reduce unit costs. That's where the sub-issues come in. One is to do lower quality. Another is to obtain discounts. Alternatively, I can focus on reducing volume. One way to reduce volume is simply to eat less, to constrain the amount that I consume. An alternative way to reduce volume is to eat more. Now, many of you are probably thinking at this point, well, by eating out more, what that means is I will reduce the purchase volume from grocery stores and I may be able to reduce my monthly grocery bill, but does that necessarily mean I'm going to reduce the amount of money that I spend upon food? And here's where we get back to defining the problem in the core question. If I narrowly define the problem as grocery bill, I can think about a potential solution, which is to substitute eating out for buying groceries, that can lead me to reduce my grocery bill, but it really doesn't address the fundamental problem that I have, that I have not stated, which is how do I reduce my expenditures on food? 
So again, this is where problem statements become a choice and how you define the problem greatly influences the, how you search for solutions and what you come up with as possible solutions. In a minute, I'll talk about excuse me, solving the problem. And one way to solve the problem is to essentially pare down the issue tree, identify sub-issues that aren't that viable. One sub-issue that's not viable here is eating out more. But I state it just to make sure that I've got, again, a set of mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive potential solutions. So I'll give you an example from, from a world that I know, uh, the world of for-profit companies. And in particular, a company I know well, both because I used to live in Seattle, which is the home of Starbucks, and also because I spent five years living in France and uh, going to Starbucks in France. And Starbucks in France, as some of you may know, has not been nearly as successful in that country as it has been in other countries, in particular in the United States and in Canada. So for Starbucks, they define the problem as how can we increase total profits by X? We could think of X as 20%, 30%, you can fill in the blank there. So we have a specific target, a specific measure. And how do we increase this uh, target, total profits, within the time frame of the end of the year? Now, once I have a problem statement like this, I can then reach into my bag of frameworks of toolkits to actually think about structuring the problem. One way that we can think about structuring the problem is to think about the answer to the question, broadly speaking, where can profits and therefore sales come from? Well, in, in my issue tree that you see, it can come from one of three potential sources. Number one, it can come from our existing stores in France. So we could ask the question, how can Starbucks increase their profits from their existing stores? So profits can also come from expanding the number of stores. So that's the second branch of the issue tree. So again, we might pose the question, how might Starbucks go about changing its store network by either adding stores or removing stores to increase profit? And then finally, an alternative way to think about this is we could think about expanding profits by increasing the scope of Starbucks. In other words, diversifying beyond retail stores, potentially into non-retail formats. For example, selling Starbucks coffee through retailers, grocery stores, for example. So these are three alternative paths that we could think about to solving Starbucks profitability problem. These come from a business specific framework. And then for example, we can decompose solving or addressing the issue of increasing profits through existing stores into a few alternative approaches. So we could think about trying to increase profits from individual consumers. In other words, how do we go about increasing revenues from existing customers. In other words, very simply put, how do we get them to spend more on average every time they're in a Starbucks? Alternatively, we could think about increasing the number of customers, so attracting new customers. Alternative to that, we could think about focusing on cost. So how do we reduce the variable cost in serving our customers? And then finally, how could we focus on reducing cost, all costs, both fixed and variable, for our customers. All of these are alternative paths to, again, increasing profitability in our existing stores. Now, if I pick one of those branches, how can we increase uh, new customers? We have a few ways there. We could widen product choices. We could speed up the queues, right? So if we want more customers, that means we have gonna have longer lines. We're gonna have to deal with that possibly by uh, speeding up the queues. How are we gonna get new customers? We may have to generate greater awareness through marketing. So again, we can decompose that into more specific sub-issues. At the end here, these are potential solutions. And again, the question remains, how do we choose amongst these potential solutions? So I like to refer to these sub-issues as, as insights. These are things that we can then analyze and then start to choose amongst them as solutions to Starbucks profitability problem. And here's where frameworks can be useful. So we can use frameworks that are specific to the retail industry. So for example, thinking about this from the perspective of store growth, so increasing the number of stores versus expanding profits from existing stores. We can think of functional frameworks that are, that are for functional areas like marketing or strategy or finance. 
And if we don't have frameworks, we can try to use pure logic as we talk about in the book. We can make distinctions between past versus future. We can think about qualitative versus quantitative options. We can think about current ideas and that forces us to think about other options that we haven't thought about. So again, we call these logical breakdowns. Frameworks actually help us structure problems. They help us identify branches and sub-branches of the issue trees. And again, these frameworks can be from industries, they can be quite narrow to, again, functional frameworks or pure old logic, which can be quite broad, not specific to organizations or to industries. And as a result, they can have uh, less or more insight. Once we've structured a problem, we then have to talk about solving the problem. And solving the problem, we use issue trees to identify the potential solutions and conduct analysis on those solutions. So solving is very much about moving from structuring problems to analyzing potential solutions to then choose what solution we're actually going to implement. And this means we need to prioritize our issue trees as potential solutions. We can then formulate hypotheses. We can then collect data to test the hypotheses and then that can lead us to either identifying a potential solution or reprioritizing potential solutions. What I'm going to do is, again, I'm, I'm conscious of the time that I have with you, is talk about two tools that we talk about in the book to try to prioritize issue trees. So one is the 80-20 rule. The 80-20 rule is if you look at an issue tree that you've developed for a problem, you can probably quite quickly look at what are the few issues that are going to have the biggest impact, that are going to have the likely biggest bang for the buck in terms of the cost of the solution. In addition to that, you can think about prioritizing potential solutions based upon two dimensions. Number one, what's the likely impact on the problem? In other words, what's the likely impact on how we define success for the problem? And the other dimension is, can we actually do this? In other words, the feasibility of this. Both of these tools will allow us to prioritize issues in terms of taking them in to the hypothesis testing uh, phase of problem solving. What the 80-20 rule does is it, allow us, it allows us to trim the tree. It allows us to identify potential branches of the tree that will probably have very little impact. And as a result of that, we don't have to take those issues and sub-issues into the analytical stage. So we can use the 80-20 rule to trim the tree. We can then use the issues and sub-issues that are left over from trimming the tree using the 80-20 rule to prioritize them using a prioritization matrix. And then we can rank order those issues and sub-issues from, again, the most or highest priority to the least priority. And then that tells us what we're actually going to take into the analytical phase of problem solving. And what we tend to do here in the analytical phase is we tend to express the sub-issue as an answer to a question in the issue tree as a yes or no. We frame that question as a hypothesis. In other words, we have a belief that, for example, in the Starbucks case, that kiosks are a way to reduce the queue length, and reducing queue length is going to be critical to our ability to attract new customers, which is going to be critical to our ability to improve profitability. So if that's our belief, what's the rationale for the belief? And then what is the analysis that we're gonna to need to perform to actually test whether that belief is right or wrong? What's the data we're gonna to need to collect? And what's the analysis that we're gonna to perform to either the confirm or repute our hypothesis? And then of course, where are we gonna get the data? So I've already mentioned one particular hypothesis in the Starbucks case. We're focusing on the branch of how to increase profitability from existing stores the sub-branch of increasing profitability in existing stores by attracting new customers, and then doing that by reducing queue length or speeding up the, the, the queues by investing in automated kiosks. So here, the issue is, should Starbucks invest $25 million in automated kiosk? The hypothesis is, yes, we should, because we believe that by investing $25 million in kiosks, in France will reduce the average wait time by 20%. And as a result of that, reducing the number of customers that leave before buying anything. And as a result of that, increasing profitability. 
we have a rationale for doing so, and then we can think about the analysis that we, we would need to perform to actually test that hypothesis, and then we can use that analysis framework to think about where are we going to collect this data. Because again, now that we've identified a very particular potential solution, before assuming that we have the right solution, like Ron Johnson did in the JCPenney case, we want to test as quickly as possible and as cheaply as possible that this is the correct solution before scaling this solution up. In other words, in the Starbucks case, spending $25 million on kiosks and rolling these kiosks out across all Starbucks stores in France. Now, there's an alternative way to solve problems that we talked about in the book that Liette mentioned at the very top that I will just quickly run through because it's a very different approach than what I've described to you up to this point in time. The approach that I've described to you up to this point in time is, is a very deductive approach to problem solving. In other words, it's a top-down approach. It requires us to have frameworks and theories to construct an issue tree. And sometimes there are problems where we don't have a theory, we don't have a framework. And as a result, we have very little insight into what is causing the problem. And as a result, very little insight into what potential solutions might be. This is where the toolkit of design thinking can be useful to solve complex organizational problems. Design thinking, as some of you may know, is a disciplined human or user-centered approach to solving problems in a creative fashion. And that raises the question of when is design thinking useful? Well, it really depends upon the type of problem. I like to think about problems existing in three types of buckets. There are problems that, that consist of known knowns. In other words, you know how to solve the problem. There are known unknowns. In other words, you know ways to find out how to solve the problem. And then finally, there are unknown unknowns, which is very, uh, I would say, parks to or echoes the Donald Rumsfeld uh, press conference back when the United States invaded Iraq for the first time. And this is where you don't know how to solve the problem because you don't know what the potential causes are. In other words, you have blind spots. And basically what design thinking argues is that the extent to which you don't understand the causes of potential problem means that you are blind to potential solutions. And it's those blind spots that represent creative opportunities for solving the problem. And this is precisely where design thinking can be useful. It's not useful for known knowns. It's not particularly useful for known unknowns, but it can be quite useful for solving problems where you don't even know what you don't know. In other words, you don't know the causes. So a known known, a classic example of that is checklist thinking. For example, if you're an airline pilot and you encounter turbulence, so turbulence is a problem, what do you do when you encounter turbulence? The checklist says you switch off automatic pilot and you go to manual control. Then there are situations where you have a problem, such as your smartphone crashes. And in addition to understanding the problem, you know what the potential causes are. In other words, you have a theory of what could cause this problem. In that case, your job is to search through the issue tree, search through the potential causes, and isolate what the actual cause is, and then use that insight to solve the problem. In fact, if you are a smartphone manufacturer, this is precisely what you provide your telecom operator customers. So when a customer calls in and says, my smartphone has crashed, the customer service representative has a screen, a diagnostic screen that comes up, and what it requires the customer service representative to do is to ask a series of questions. And those questions reflect all potential causes of why the smartphone for, should, could crash. And by asking those questions, the customer service representative, representative is actually searching through the solution space and then trying to identify the actual cause. Once they do, they know what the solution is. Finally, there are problems where you have no idea what the causes are. For example, you have customers that have stopped buying from you and you have no idea why. You have no theory, you have no frameworks. As a result of that, you can't develop an issue tree. It's in this case that design thinking can be quite useful. In other words, if you have an ill-defined problem, 
where you are uncertain about the causes, possibly because it's a complex problem. There are a variety of interrelated causes. And at the end of this problem, there's a, a human being. In other words, human beings actually experience the problem. This is where design thinking can be useful. And what we talk about in the book is the design thinking process where we build upon the industrial design firm IDEO's framework of using empathy to understand the problem. Once we understand the problem better, we can then define it. We then go into a stage of coming up with potential solutions. In other words, developing or generating ideas for potential solutions, taking those potential solutions into the prototyping stage and then testing them. So I'll quickly walk you through this and then I think I'll end uh, the conversation at the, the solve stage rather than the sell stage. So, so empathy is very much about asking who is experiencing the problem and then trying to see the problem from their perspective, to try to understand the problem from their perspective using three basic approaches. Trying to immerse yourself in the life of the user, the person experiencing the problem. So this is often referred to as day in the life. So trying to put yourself in the shoes of the customer, of the user, of the person that's experiencing the problem and trying to understand it from their perspective. Alternatively, you can use observation, for example, ethnographic observation, where you observe people that are experiencing the problem. And then finally, you can engage them by uh, doing semi-structured interview. The entire focus of the empathy stage is to rather than deductively derive the solution space using issue trees, we are going to inductively develop a theory of the solution space, one observation, one interview, one immersion activity at a time. So we're gonna build a theory of what is causing the problem, and then we're going to use that inductively derived theory to define the problem, and then use that problem definition or better understanding of the theory to generate potential solutions to the problem, possibly through brainstorming, then to pick some of those solutions to actually systematically test them quickly and cheaply if possible, to then identify the best solution to the problem. So, what I want to do is I want to end with a story and I'll leave it there because I think I'm just about out of time. And this is a story about the development of a creative solution to a problem. What you see on your screen is an MRI scanner. And for those of you who have, have an MRI scan, this might be a familiar picture. It uh, looks like a giant uh, brick with a hole in the middle of it. You lay down on that bed, the patient transport bed, and what happens is you then in, are inserted into this big hole. You are asked to sit perfectly still by the technician. As you do that, the MRI scan commences. A very loud booming noise then starts to happen. And you, again, while this loud booming noise goes on, you ask to, you're asked to sit perfectly skill, still for anywhere from 15 to 30 to sometimes upwards to 45 minutes. Now, as adults, we generally can do this. But if we're talking about little children and little children being scared because they're inside a giant hole where they can't see their parents, there's a loud booming noise that's emanating. It's scary, so they start to fidget. And as a result, the MRI scan has to start over. Now, if you're a hospital administrator and you have this challenge because you've spent $5 million on building out an MRI suite to scan children, you know that the challenge for you is if I need to get a return on this investment of $5 million, I know that this is going to be challenged by the fact that kids are not going to be able to sit still. So as a result of that, I may frame the problem as you see on the screen. How can I maximize the number of child patient scans per day while reducing the cost of anesthetizing kids? In this problem statement is the solution, which is why it's a bad problem statement. The assumption is that we must anesthetize. In other words, we must sedate kids in order for them to be still, in order for them to have a CT scan. The reason that this is part of the problem statement 
is because this is medical best practice. So what you see on the screen here is a excerpt from a journal publication from Current Opinion in Anesthesiology that essentially says that for young children, they need to be sedated in order, words, in order to go under a scan. In many scan modalities, whether it's CT, MRI, or PET scans, kids are sedated upwards of 80% of the time. The story that I'll finish with is a story about this gentleman, Doug Dietz. Doug Dietz is still to this day an industrial designer for GE Medical Systems. He is responsible for designing the exterior of MRI scanners, CAT scanners, and PET scanners. In a TEDx talk that you can find online, Doug tells the story of an epiphany that he had. The epiphany came to him because he was able for a brief moment to get out of his head as an industrial designer and see and experience a, a MRI scan from the perspective of a seven-year-old girl. The story that he tells in his TEDx talk is that he went to see one of his brand new MRI scans being used in a hospital. He was asked by the technician to step out because they had a patient coming in. And what he tells is down the hallway, he sees a young girl walking towards the MRI suite with his two parents and she's crying and she's visibly scared. He then follows them into the MRI suite and the girl breaks down and is terrified of the MRI scanner. And what he conveys to the audience in the TEDx talk is that in that moment, he realized that he had been designing his scanners for adults and not for children. And he realized that the scanner that he designed that he was very proud of was extremely scary for these young children. And what that caused him to do was to try to better understand how young children experience MRI, CT, and PET scans. And through that empathetic process where he starts to interview and observe young kids, not just in MRI suites, but kids playing, he realizes he has an epiphany. He has an insight. And the insight is that kids will cooperate when they are participating in an adventure. This insight leads him to come up with a brand new series of scanners, which are branded the GE Adventure Series of Scanners. And these scanners are essentially part of a broader theme. So what you see in front of you is a GE Adventure scan series that is the nautical or pirate theme. This is an installation at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center in the United States. So you see the MRI scan, the giant uh, entry point, the hole is the tiller of a ship. You see the rest of the ship. You see on the floor, the ocean, you see on the wall, a pirate's first mate swinging. What you don't see in this picture, what you can't appreciate is when the child walks into this uh, theater, nautical music is playing. The MRI technician is dressed as a pirate with a, a patch on his eye and a fake parrot on the shoulder. And the child that is getting scanned is the central actor in a play. And as a result of being the central actor in the play, what happens is that they sit still. And what this meant for Doug Dietz is that this empathetic moment he had with kids caused him to fundamentally reframe the problem. Because what he understood for the first time is the needs that these kids have is to be able to play and have fun. In other words, they wanna feel like a normal kid. The insight that he generated from observing kids and engaging with them was that kids will participate, they will engage, they will cooperate, when they feel like it's an adventure. So the new question that he asked is how might, we how might we turn MRI scans for children into an adventure? This led them to the uh, adventure series scans. And as a result of that, sedation rates fell from 80% to 10% at this location at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. So this is an alternative way to solve complex problems when you have very little insight into what the potential causes are. You literally have to build that understanding from the bottom up. Issue trees are useful when you have frameworks, when you have theories that help you develop the issue tree. Design thinking is an approach that is useful when you don't have a, a good understanding, theoretical understanding of the potential causes to the problem. 
So unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about the, the selling part of the 4S method. Suffice it to say that when you come up with a solution, for example, like the GE Medical Series or GE Adventure Series, you're going to have to sell your idea to other stakeholders. You're going to have to come up with a compelling and persuasive argument. And what we talk about in the book is a, a technique that is known as the pyramid principle to do that. So again, I'll leave that for further conversation down the road. What I will mention to you, if you're interested, is I'm happy to share all of my slides with you. All you have to do is share your email with us. And I'm also happy to share chapter one of the book that takes you a little bit deeper into the, uh, the challenges that I talked about at the top of the session. So with that, Lorette, I'd like to turn the, uh, the floor over to you to lead the discussion and the question and answer period. And I apologize for going a little bit long in the presentations. No problem. Thank you so much, uh, Corey. Very, very insightful uh, presentation and very strategically useful for most of the audience here who are in the context of the agri-food, nutrition, and so on, um, which is a complex uh, domain. Um, I will ask uh, one or two starting questions. Uh, and then you can um, you can um, use the chat box to send your question to uh, Sabina, or uh, you can unmute yourself and identify yourself uh, in asking a question. Uh, my first uh, two question, um, uh, Corey, uh, is are the following. Um, one of the things that strikes me uh, from a management uh, perspective is our strategy, which you are part of, is kind of in the business of operating, managing, and make all of it work. Um, and somewhat distant, we have innovation, as if kind of a, a business happens when the innovation pipeline goes to market. And so much of uh, what needs to be done in our view when we talk about convergence innovation is that um, technical innovation, business, and so on, it's all part of finding a way to create wealth differently in a sustainable manner and with all the good stuff that uh, comes with it when you talk about uh, healthcare or sustainable development. Um, how would you, um, uh, how would you, enrich the way we think of innovation from a framework or an approach like yours? Or conversely, how can you bring innovation uh, more uh, into your strategic thinking of management so that it's not after innovation happened that you just enter into the picture? That's my first question. Okay. And the second question, it's uh, uh, as uh, people in this series are, are uh, well aware, we talk a lot those days about big data, artificial intelligence, and so on. And it's really um, important. And that's what your talk is about human intelligence and strategic thinking, uh, whether it's the rational or, or more design thinking, um, our human capability that will never be completely replaced, but how can there be a better integration between uh, the human and the artificial side of intelligence in addressing those complex problems? Okay, those are two great questions. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take them in order. I'll take the first question, which is really a question about innovation, as you said, and the the method that I just described, the forest method and its utility for innovation. So I'll start with the following. Is someone that's been researching, studying innovation, primarily technological innovation for the last 20 years, I, I would say the dominant way that I think and a lot of people think about innovation is from a problem solving perspective. In other words, innovation is often triggered by a problem. In other words, somebody says there's got to be a better way. Somebody says, I see an opportunity to improve a particular outcome. So for, to a great extent, innovation is often the result of a problem solving process. If it's the result of a problem solving process, it begins with somebody identifying a problem. Now, I wanna talk about that just for one second. What I've found in, in talking about problem solving over the last 20 years is that 
sometimes people view the term problem pejoratively. In other words, it has negative connotations. They don't like the term problem. They like the term challenge. Even better, they like the term opportunity. That's fine because all of them are saying basically the same thing. There's a current state and then there's a desired future state. And the current state is not the desired future state. In other words, you're saying to yourself, there could be a better way. There must be a better way. For me, that's a problem. And, and what that often then triggers is a search for a creative solution. So again, you say innovation. I have a fairly basic mm -hmm. definition of innovation, but I think it's worth mentioning because innovation for me, to a great extent, is the successful commercial commercialization or the successful implementation of something, of a solution. What precedes that is invention. In other words, the creative act of developing the solution. So if there's a creative act, in other words, if there are human beings that are creating, thinking up, these ideas for solutions and then implementing them again it begs the question what is motivating people to pursue these creative acts and again i would say usually there's a recognition of a problem there's a recognition that for a particular a, a very specific domain of activity we can improve now, obviously, in the Doug Deeds case, it was in the world of CT scanners, the problem that he identified was there, for him, there was far too high of use of anesthesia and sedation for kids when undergoing a CT scan. And the epiphany that he had was, if I view this through the eyes of a seven-year-old, there has to be a better way. So again, it leads me to defining the problem, reframing the problem in a different way than let's say a hospital administrator would do. And that triggers a search for solutions. In other words, it triggers a search for a creative solution, a better way. So the toolkit that we talk about in the book, the problem solving process, I think is very consistent with the idea of innovation, innovation being essentially triggered by a problem and being a search for a solution to that problem, and then having to convince other people to adopt that solution. To a great extent, that maps very nicely to our 4S process. Mm -hmm. Take the problem, structure the problem, solve it, and then you gotta sell it. Sell it to me is very much moving from, I've got the solution, and now I have to convince people to actually use or adopt my solution. I think what's critical for, for innovation is, like it is for any problem-solving process, trying to understand at the beginning what the problem is. In other words, trying to define it and trying to state it. Now, in, in innovation and in invention, as in pretty much any problem-solving process, the problem definition is always a moving target. In other words, as my late father used to say, you always reserve the right to get smarter. In other words, <laughs> as you learn, as you go through the generation of potential solutions, that often causes you to see the problem in a different way, which causes you to go back to the very beginning and then redefine the problem. But I think what it begins with is saying, if we're going to come up with an innovative solution to anything, any challenge, any opportunity, any problem that we see in the world, it's going to be beneficial to spend some time trying to figure out what tells us that, that there is a problem. In other words, what's the trouble? What's the gap that we see? What is going to define success? How do we know if we've actually solved this problem, right? Who the owner is? What are the constraints? I think all of these things are relevant, not just to strategic problems in organizations, but they're relevant to uh, problems of innovation as well. Um, I would say design thinking has become much more widely used, widely known under the umbrella of innovation because it's a toolkit for solving problems in a creative way. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that one of the criticisms of strategy consultants is that they're not particularly creative, which <laughs> is fine. Oftentimes to solve a problem doesn't mean you need a new solution that doesn't already exist. 
using tried and true solutions from other domains and then testing them in a, in a new area and finding that they work, that may not be creative, but it still solves the problem. So again, for me, innovation is a problem solving process. And I see a lot of utility from our, our framework, our method in the world of innovation. The second question is a question we get a lot these days, which is the question about the rise of, of artificial intelligence, which is a very particular type of analytic approach, primarily a predictive analytic approach, which means you need data. So all these things in terms of sort of the rise of big data, the, rise, the improvement in different uh, machine learning algorithms, and therefore the increasing ability of machine learning to do a better job in making predictions relative to human beings. That thinking and that trend, I think, triggers the concern that is AI as a field of endeavor and the tools that get developed in AI, the machine learning algorithms, are they going to replace human beings? What you get is you get highly stylized ways to frame this debate. It's either you say AI is going to substitute for people, which means no longer do we need human beings to solve problems because AI will take care of that. The alternative is to say it's not going to replace people. It's not going to be a substitute. It's going to complement our ability to solve problems. Right. And I like most things, it's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. There are very specific types of human activity that AI is going to replace. AI is going to substitute. There are other areas of human activity that, again, this could just be my lack of imagination, <laughs> and my lack of insight into where the field of AI is going to go. But if I think about what I know about AI, essentially my own use of AI tools, programming, machine learning algorithms in R, and certainly my conversations with computer scientists that are working in the field of AI, what they still tell me is, look, you still need a human being to identify the problem that you are then going to say, I'm going to develop an algorithm to try to help solve. So there's still going to be the need for human beings to identify problems, to define problems, and then to start to say, this is how we're going to structure the problem. And this is where we think we're going to need data and algorithms to, uh, to solve it. You're still going to need human beings to do that. So again, my guess is that in the world of problem solving, which to me is the world of innovation, I think AI is going to be largely complementary to human beings rather than a substitute for human beings. But again, that, that could simply be just a lack of imagination on my part and where AI is going to go in the future. Let's hope that it's not just lack of imagination. <laughs> Any question from the from the virtual floor? You, uh, Sabina, are, are everybody uh, on mute? Can they just identify themselves if they have questions? Is that question? Uh, yeah. Hello, this is Atefe. Thank you, uh, Corey, for a very interesting presentation yeah. and uh, great examples, by the way. Um, I had one question which is relevant to, I think, uh, many of um, the audience, and it's, um, I wanted to know your uh, thinking about um, resolving today's more challenging societal environmental problems, which are usually very difficult in terms of even defining the problem. Yeah. So it seems that define the whole problem itself is a complex problem. Yeah, well. So, uh, and and I was wondering if uh, what's your perspective on using like framework approach to solving problem of let's say health, uh, food, agriculture, like the whole complexity and interconnected problems that are there. Yeah. And at the same time, what about design thinking when we have multiple stakeholders? So we are not facing with single customer or uh, like single um, stakeholder that we want to to target, but more yeah. of an array of stakeholders like right. consumers like um multiple stakeholders which with an array of again problems including like economic social and uh, environmental uh, affiliated problems so thank you no that's a great question and thank you for asking it i mean 
what you just described, and, and you, I'm sure you know this, those are wicked problems. I mean, this is how sort of the world of design thinking and the world of design has referred to those type of problems. So highly complex. In other words, there's a, a large number of underlying causes where those causes have great interdependency. They are linked. So it's complex. And what makes it even more complex is that we're not solving it for one discrete identifiable stakeholder. So a, cust a type of customer user, but a variety of stakeholders. So again, wicked problems tend to have a, a very high degree of complexity, both from the number of types of individuals that are involved in the, the, the experiencing the problem and also in the dimensionality of the underlying causes. These types of pro problems historically challenge the first approach that I talked about, which is very much the top down issue tree theory driven approach to problem solving. In other words, if you're going to, if you're going to use theory and frameworks derived from theory to solve problems, then you have to have a theory. The types of problems you're talking about, if I think about, if I put on my hat as an academic research scientist, we don't have the type of theory, that sort of causal understanding of these high dimensional complex problems, which means things like issue trees and things like hypothesis pyramids that we talk about in the paper, those are gonna be largely ineffectual because what we're basically saying is that if you think about the metaphor of a, of a solution space, our understanding of the solution space is really, really poor when it comes to wicked problems, high dimensional complex problems, because our theory, our theoretical causal understanding is quite poor, which means that toolkit is going to have severe limitations. Now, if you acknowledge that, you could be nihilistic and say, throw your hands up and say, there's nothing we can do. Right? These type of highly complex, wicked problems, we just can't solve because the state of knowledge of mankind or of humankind isn't sufficiently well developed to do it. Well, I think there's some promise in the world of design thinking because this is precisely, I think, one of the values of a design thinking approach. Design thinking approach, in other words, an inductive approach. We have to invest in trying to understand the problem from the different stakeholders that are involved in it and experience with it and try to inductively develop a causal understanding. And what it really means is trying to marry these two approaches, a top down approach that's very much consistent with, I would say, what we would call normal science today, which is a, a theory driven approach to hypothesis testing, right? So we've got theory, that theory has been validated from that theory comes frameworks that gives us an understanding of part of the solution space. But we have to marry that with essentially an inductive oriented approach where we actively try to engage with different stakeholders. And again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop a better understanding of the solution space. Does that mean these two things combined are going to help us? Are they going to be a panacea? I don't think so. History has proven that. But I think these two approaches are complementary. They're not substitutes. And using them together can be better than if we say we're just going to use one approach or the other. So I hope that helps uh, answer your question. Um, again, I don't think the, the state of knowledge that we have from a theoretical standpoint alone is going to do it. I think we've got to go both routes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are you fine, Natasha? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Corey. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. And then are there burning questions before we close? We are already at 1235, 34. No? Well, thank you so much, uh, Corey, for very, very insightful uh, presentation. Uh, a reminder that uh, uh, the first chapter of the book uh, will be made available for uh, the participant as well as the deck of slides. Um, and uh, our next uh, CI webinar uh, will be, uh, the date is still to be confirmed, but the, during the week of March uh, 21st, I believe 20th, um, and it will be this time on the whole space of eco-innovation 
for sustainable development and sustainable innovation. Uh, thank you very, very much, all of you. Thank you, Corey. Um, and uh, see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye.